In our world, everything is possible. You can be who you are. You can show your true you. You can sing. You can dance. You can achieve. Yeah! Acceptance is everywhere. Possibilities are endless. And every creative dream, every style, everyone can simply express their deepest dreams, their truest stories. A creative world in harmony. Harmony 20. Dare to be you. Dare to create. Hello, animators and artists. My name is Mike, and welcome to a Toon Boom interview. Mark Borgians runs his design studio, Handmade Monsters, in Antwerp, Belgium. Mark's illustrations have been published in advertising, editorial, reference books, and galleries around the world. He is also an accomplished independent animator. The music video that Handmade Monsters brought to life for Stanley Cole's Separated was nominated to more than 20 film festivals worldwide, winning six awards. We selected Mark as a 2020 Toon Boom Ambassador, in part for his impressive character rigs made using master controllers in Harmony. And we wanted him to animate a scene for the Harmony 20 demo video in his signature style, which draws inspiration from graphic design and prints from the 1960s and 70s. Mark is joining us live from Belgium to discuss his scene from the Harmony 20 demo video. It's hard to sum up an artist's work in less than 30 seconds, so I'm going to turn this to Mark. Hey, hey what is Handmade hi. Monsters, and what kind of work do you do? Well, can I show you a couple of things? Yeah, let's go for it. So, I... Let me try and share my screen with you. And uh, while we're putting this together, if you have questions for... Uh, Mark Borgians, uh, let us know in the chat and we can ask them live on the air. So, my name is Mark. I work from uh, Antwerp in Belgium. I work alone. I have a design studio, but that's nothing more than just me sitting at a desk. Uh, I am over here mainly known for uh, working together with a couple of friends on audio plays that come out in picture books. But so these are a uh, couple of the uh, books I was just talking about. So these are picture books, uh, mainly full page pictures, very little text. Uh, but they have this uh, hybrid sort of vector pixel look that I think is very rewarding to the, the stuff I want to do. Then apart from that, uh, or next to that, I also do gallery work. So I just uh, lined up a couple of pieces of uh, gallery work uh, from the last few years. So I participate in these uh, pop group shows and on the West Coast uh, that always have certain themes. And then I make something mostly movie or television uh, inspired work. Uh, and then I make work, uh, some client work. This is a uh, recent uh, stuff for 8-bit. And then I make these uh, characters on my Instagram where I have a lot of fun in just trying to create these with as limited means possible. So they're, each character is just made from two uh, color uh, channels and then I do uh, animation work and the animation work is really like a, a moving version of my uh, illustration work it's very much it's uh, it's it's very yeah I I, uh, I look at it really as a moving version of uh, an illustration so it's seldom that it's a big uh, production structure or anything. It's uh, really like just, yeah, more lively uh, illustration work. I look at it basically at the same, in the same way. So that sort of stuff all led me to be part of this. What was the, uh, the prompt that you were given for the Harmony 20 demo video and how did you interpret it for this project? Well, uh, 
Toonboom had prepared a textual uh, scenario, and uh, we were in a chat together with uh, the seven people working on the project, and uh, we discussed a bit what it was gonna, uh, what was gonna be the, the focus of each piece. I think we all were selected also because we had a certain visual style that was complementary the one to the other. And then for me, it was between like the, the introduction, the first few lines or the couple of lines after that, because they're, they're, they were talking about uh, uh, creativity and, and exploring uh, possibilities and stuff. And I could immediately relate to that. And I thought, well, I can work from that. So I ended up picking the, the opening scene. And I worked from there. Uh, how is the scope of this project different or similar to the animation that you typically produce? It's a bit, uh, a bit of the same in scope, really. It's, uh, of course, it's it's a very short clip, so it's not going from one scenery to the other. It all stayed very much in a, in one place, but it was uh, that was kind of the the daunting. Uh, thing of the of the project as well because I knew it was the opening, so I wanted it to like have an, a little ease in that you wouldn't be thrown into the project or thrown into the movie uh, without even knowing it was uh, running already. So I wanted it to have a, a calm ease in, and then still get to some sort of action fairly quickly because it's uh, like less than seven seconds or something. Yeah, uh, so, your scene escalates really quickly from this uh, squirrel climbing a tree to giants towering over an entire forest. How did you plan out that transition? Okay, so this is an illustration I did a couple of years ago. It was rejected, so they never used it, but it had something that uh, the brief for this was the love of nature. And I went with the concept of tree huggers. I once saw a uh, some documentary thing about tree huggers and it triggered me. And in here, like between the big giant and uh, the woodsman with the blue beard, it sort of becomes like a, a hybrid. Where's, where's a tree and where's, where do you get a character? And this was something that triggered me. And when I started the, pro uh, the project for the, this Toon Boon thing, I thought back about this and I thought that, well, maybe this was uh, an, a nice moment to revisit this, uh, this thing that kept popping in my head all the time. So I went with the, the trees uh, being, some of the trees are actually legs from, from, the, from the giants, but it's with the simple camera movement, uh, it, it brings you to a whole new world. And that was something I quite liked. So you, you, uh, you define like a, a, small, uh, a small scale with a squirrel. And then just by moving the camera up, you open up the complete scene and you have these giants uh, moving about in a, in a whole big landscape. And to me, that was a way to use the limited time uh, to to bring a whole broader scope to to a little scene, if that makes any sense to you. Yeah, yeah, no, it really does. Um, so what were some of the most uh, technically or artistically challenging elements of the scene? The, the most difficult thing is always to, like when you have these big movements, uh, like with the drummer giant, uh, the way he approaches the camera, uh, there's a need to, to give it some gravitas or you wouldn't read it as a giant. So the most work I had on, on the whole thing was making sure that he was uh, acceptable as a giant creature approaching. Like normally you would do that with like slowing the movement down because there's so much weight you have to 
but I didn't want to do that and I didn't have the time to do that. So it was really like the balancing act between the, the speed of the thing and the acceptance of it being a giant. So we are going to dive into the scene. And uh, while we do that, feel free to drop questions for uh, Mark in the chat. And uh, while you're queuing that up, uh, you've mentioned before that you enjoy the, uh, the imperfection and restrictions that uh, come with print media uh, and its influence in your style, even in digital animation. Uh, how did you bring those elements into the scene? Uh, some of it is done by uh, putting a, a color correction note just before the, uh, uh, the right note, just to glue the whole color scheme a bit uh, to a, set, a washed and a, 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 a sun uh, a sun infected like print it, it the, the colors are washed a bit uh, and there's also like a a camera focus that's slightly off yeah. so like it's it's little things like when you have and you have that with Simpsons too but like with the Hanna Barbera stuff like you see the shadows in between the the celluloids and it's this sort of stuff that triggers me like you see it's not meant to like a sh character is not meant to throw a shadow on on a background but they do and sometimes you see it in between a hand uh, or an arm and a and a body and it's that sort of stuff i try to bring into my animations as well so the, the layering and, and the not too perfect, sometimes a bit quirky movements, but making, making it so that it's, uh, it's acceptable. I can see that we got a question from the chat. Uh, John, Johnson Smith too asks, uh, what do you think is an artistic or cinematic technique that is underused in animation, but has a lot of good potential? Ooh, that's a serious one. I think restriction, basically. Hmm. It's think, limitations. Limitation, yeah. Uh, like, and and that's what what sets the a lot of the the stuff from the fifties and sixties, and even like the big uh, graphic designers from back then, the ones doing animation work too, they really approached it from uh, a very graphic distillation. Whereas a lot of animation, not, and it's not limited to animation, it's, it's, it's all over the board, I think, but uh, a lot of it is like uh, piling stuff on top of other stuff and piling and more and more and, and explosions here and, and there and, and making it like as colorful as you can. And where, whereas in, in like restricting yourself to just a couple colors and maybe some tints of those colors and restricting yourself to like a very limited camera movement, but an effective camera movement. It's in, in, in uh, working with those that I think uh, you can gain a lot of uh, personality. Is that where the uh, two color characters project that you uh, created on Instagram was inspired by the sort of need for limitations? Yes, very much so. And also uh, the way I make them, they also uh, allow for uh, little happy accidents. Like sometimes uh, a leg shadow runs over in the body where it shouldn't and it's these sort of, uh, like they say in French, accident de parcours, like things that happen when you do other things, but they, mm. but it's, it's, it's true. It's very much uh, an exercise in that limited scope. So it's a little bit more process oriented than planning. It's, I wouldn't say process oriented. I would say, uh, 
uh, result oriented. Hmm. Like the thing needs to look interesting. Hey, we got a question from the chat. Uh, The question is, uh, what is one of your projects that you enjoyed the most? Either working on or the end result? What was the last thing? Uh, What was the project that you enjoyed the most, either while you were working on it or the end result? Uh, Really, and and that's not uh, an animation thing, but I was really happy working on the uh, album cover art for the uh, Ape Out soundtrack for I Am 8-Bit that I just finished. It's uh, about to be released in a couple of weeks, I think. How are we looking forward to that then? Yeah, (laughs) it's a very good soundtrack. Uh, for the Harmony 20 demo video, uh, which of the characters did you enjoy designing the most? You had uh, what, four characters on screen. There was a squirrel and there were three giants. Yeah, maybe I can uh, run you through the design process a bit. So to show you yeah. how, how they come about. Let's dive into it. So because I'm just a one-man uh, outfit, I don't really have the need to like do very clean uh, presentations to myself because I know what I want to present. So this, these are my first sketches and I really like uh, more than uh, anything else. They're just part of my early thought process. So these just bring me to a point that I think, okay, I want to do a character and he's like in shorts and he has a high head and he's like a bit blocked. And so then from there, once I know what I want to do, I start drawing them in uh, Illustrator. And uh, I do the same with the uh, scenery. So I draw everything I think I need. Uh, Do the same with the squirrel, like the squirrel, uh, there was, no bitmap element uh, going into Harmony. It was uh, all the bitmap detail was put in Harmony afterwards. And then I start uh, like detailing uh, the elements I know that don't need uh, too big of movement uh, because the things were like, like fingers where I need to be able to uh, change the fingers. Uh, those I want to keep in 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 vector, but the rest, I really like prepare uh, the artwork as I think I'm gonna want to use it uh, in separate layers on the on the end result. From there, I bring it into Harmony. And then like this is my puppet for the, for my favorite giants. So I just uh, cut it up into like all different elements. I try to work neatly, but I don't always do that because I seldom like reuse. I seldom work with assets that I need for more than the couple of seconds I am working with. But then I start to cut them up and, and make the variations of the stuff I think I need. And then from there, I do, uh, like, let me show you. All movement is done by really very few, but effective, like, what is it? One, two, three, four, five uh, deformers. So it's really very basic, but they yeah, do but what they need You get a lot of do. mileage out of a very simple uh, rig. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And then there's just a couple of things I need to take into account, like for instance here, where you have an arm that remains in the background and that needs to go over in the foreground. So I need to patch that up. And then I made sure, and that's the sort of bitmap stuff I do in uh, in Harmony, so if I, think I need like a little helper for contrast. So I create these little patching uh, shadow 
uh, lines so it doesn't become one big blobby thing. How long did this particular giant take you to uh, draw and rig from start to finish? Oh, uh, once I knew what to do, I think a little under a day or something. Wow. But the thing is, I'm, I'm not really like, I'm not really well uh, organized in that sort of thing. Like I go back and forth and back and forth. Like I, I start rigging and then I see, well, ah, I want this different from what I'm doing. So I go back a couple of steps and, and redo certain things that if you look at it from a, uh, from a good pr uh, production perspective are maybe not the, the best sort of decisions. And then here, like I felt that it could use like a, uh, just at like a six stage head turn, like one straight and one looking down, one looking up didn't make too much sense because of the head. And then I put it into a master controller. And so I, I'm going to get rid of that. <laughs> oh, that's great. This sort of stuff I, I really like. It's so rewarding. So it's the master controller is so easy to set up and then doing it. I can like, I need to make sure that I don't lose myself in playing like this for too long because it's, I should do some work instead of playing, but this is so rewarding to me. Uh, earlier you were showing me some of the uh, different mouthpieces that you have, where you have the, the different uh, controls for the, the teeth. Yeah. So I prepared like this and I didn't know uh, how much movement I was going to need. So I didn't, end up using everything I, I prepared, like all this is in there, but I also prepared like it's like it's it's three elements basically. It's the mouth, the exterior of the mouth, and it has an interior color, but the color is used as a mask. So I have uh, an output that goes just for the outer line, like the lips, and then I filtered out the inner and then I use the inner color as a mask for the elements that go beyond, behind there. And so I had those two teeth elements and just a slight scaling on the mouth. But it's so easy, like... Yeah, I, I love the different pieces. And with your style, all the different pieces uh, feel like their own objects that are moving. So it's, uh, it's very interesting to see. But it's very like if I like take this, it's, so it's just like the lips. It's just three three drawings, and I throw them into a a simple uh, slider controller. I'm just using it as it is now. Get rid of that. But instead of like having to read uh, or keyframe all the the stuff separately, I now have this very simple slider controller that does all the work for me and. Like it's so easy now to just animate these pieces and stuff like that. Like I prepare a puppet and then I think, oh, wouldn't it be easy to, or wouldn't it be great if I could just like have this little controller that makes it easy for me to like put extra sherry on the cake with this element. And it's so easy to, to throw in an extra slider or an extra master controller like here. So I really 
like it, when I work on a project, it really grows from a starting point and then it's like uh, sculpting, like going layer per layer and then uh, sending it up finer and finer each step I go. So in that way, I think it's uh, it's a bit of variation on the uh, on the traditional animation where you go from sketching to uh, cleaning up and coloring. I start with the cleaned up artwork, but I do that sort of uh, fine tuning in the animation process, which is, I think, uh, typical for cutout animation, maybe. But it's it's the way I, I I think about those things. You were mentioning earlier how uh, you were working to give the giants a sense of scale. Do you want to switch over to the uh, the project file where you have all of the giants on the, yes. uh, the, the scene with the multiplane camera? I will do. Yeah. This takes a while for uh, because of all the stuff that's going on on my computer. I'm sorry about that. No problem. Uh, while we're waiting for that to load, um, do you find there were any new features in Harmony 20 that you would continue to use in your professional practice? Oh, I'm uh, I'm always happy and and very anxious to uh, try the new notes. So uh, since I'm such a fan of uh, the deformers, I'm really happy that they got like a real bump in, in this new version with, uh, with the way you be, uh, you're able to stack uh, deformers one on top of the other and, and an envelope on the, on the curve and, and things like that. That's something that I'm really, really very interested in in, uh, in diving into. I haven't done that much with it yet, but I'm sure I will. That's the main thing. I'm, uh, I'm anxious in... Uh, getting my my head around. All right, so got the the trees, the forest, the squirrels. Yeah, so like here, you have this. This is a lag, and this is a lag. And then if you go further. You have that guy. <laughs> I love that zoom out. What I something I used for the first time is the uh, focus note, and it's of course not showing in uh, in the rough render. But you, know. you get a, a very nice sort of depth of field effect that you can oh, switch it's, from and the it's, squirrel to the. Yeah, so I, I made a little uh, I made a little dot that I could move around in the scene. So it's easy to uh, like point my focal point, like having the focus here on the uh, drummer guy, and then like 50 frames further, you have the focus here on this guitar guy. It's so easy to, to move. Like that's the sort of thing I used to do in, uh, in post-processing and now uh, with those notes, it's very easy for me to do that sort of stuff uh, in the animation itself, which means that if the timing changes, so does the timing of the uh, of the focus node, and so there's no need to uh, rematch the timing in the uh, post processing, which is a very big time saver. Oh, I'm sure. And like here, there's like some color uh, correction on the front trees because basically they're the same as the uh, the deeper trees. But it's yeah, all so, so like, and then some color correction here on the on the drummer as well to have it to give him a bit of contrast with the foreground. So that's all done with uh, color correction notes. So you had mentioned to me uh, that you moved uh, either all of or most of your process uh, to within, Har within Harmony instead of using uh, other software for post-production. Mm -hmm. uh, what sort of tools in Harmony uh, made it easier to do post-production? Uh, things like color correction, 
is something that I really like uh, to be able to do here. Like I have, uh, I'm not sure if I can. It's very, like it's very simple things, but like just this little guy here, to me makes a complete, uh, a very big difference, right? And it might not be as, as losing my, Okay, so yeah, you, you can see the difference. Like, and that's the, that's like the, an old film stock. That's one of those uh, old, like the things, the, the, the aesthetic of the imperfect of old stuff that I'm talking about. It's really very much this sort of thing. So it's stuff like that, that I really like, uh, being able to do in here. Uh, so I know that you uh, use a lot of bitmap assets in your work. Mm -hmm. Do you have advice for artists who animate with, or who, who want to animate with bitmap assets, who want to bring in stuff that they've made in other software and uh, apply deformers on them? Like, what, what are your sort of pointers for that? For me, it's a, it's a whole preparing of the bitmap stuff. Like, if I have these characters, like let's say, uh, like this this giant, let's say, and you have the legs, if you know you want to move them uh, independently, make them independently. Like, hmm. so you don't need to, like if you prepare it for animation, uh, keep the whole process in mind from the get-go. So you don't need to uh, cut, like make perfect cuts of the legs and then make sure you have enough material uh, for bleeding stuff or anything. Like if you take that into consideration from the get-go, the possibilities are so, uh, so limitless, basically. So I would do, uh, and in the, the same goes for the, for the vector elements, eh? like, for instance, the, the arm, this arm, if you would sketch it, it would be bent, but like straightening up a, a bent arm is, is hell to do, whereas bending a straight arm is easy to do. So you you make a, a beautiful T and it's 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 basically, a, it's a very similar process in, in preparing the artwork itself. Whether so start it's, with a more neutral pose and then bend it. Yeah, but like, make sure you have all the elements you want to be able to manipulate independently, prepare them independently. So in our previous conversations, uh, you've mentioned that you consider yourself to be more of a graphic designer and illustrator first, as opposed to an animator. Uh, how did you first start exploring the craft of animation and why? Oh, I've always been uh, interested in, in animation. I've, I've been, a, uh, I was the kid on, on family parties that was in the corner watching the television with the cartoon shows. I might not have been the most social of the bunch, but I, there's something in, in like uh, stuff like the, the opening titles for Pink Panther uh, that has always so incredibly uh, had a powerful powerful uh, magnetism uh, that I that I really found very hard to resist. And then as an illustrator, uh, what makes this trigger me more than some other stuff? Like what is it, what's the quality that draws me to something specific that is absent from certain other things? And that's like the the, the whole uh, research process of like I have this bunch of little old golden books. They're old and they have like most of them are have torn pages. They have like uh, colored paper, all old. Uh, 
smell is something you don't need to reproduce, but they have that as well. <laughs> but there is a certain a certain thing to how some stuff looks. Uh, and you have that in, in static stuff and you have that in moving stuff. It's, it's, it's a very, uh, it's one, one box of interests to me. It's, it's the same, it's the same thing. So whether it moves or not, I think movement is just something, uh, an added value of something. And I found it great to be able to put that added value to something static. Uh, you run a design practice called Handmade Monsters. How did you start your graphic design process and where did the name come from? Well, I've, I'm, a, I'm a school graphic designer, but I always had a, an illustration focus even in my uh, graphic design. And then when I started, it was like late 90s, uh, you had all these design agencies over here that had like uh, some guy's name and then graphics or, or all these uh, agencies that had like letter, letter words that were all the surnames of everyone that put money in it. And I never really liked that sort of gravitas that those names had. And I wanted a name and I wanted to have a company that didn't pretend to be more than a guy making silly drawings. So I was looking for a silly name, basically. I seldom, I, I seldom use it as a, as a way to advertise myself. It's my, it's my business, uh, my business side. But like if I do drawings or if I do gallery work, I use my personal name which might not be the best, uh, uh, the best option because it's a hard name to pronounce for overseas, <laughs> but yeah. So the handmade oh. monsters is, is, uh, it's just a way for me to try to tell you not to take me too seriously. So uh, you do freelance work. What what inspired you to uh, work freelance and do everything that you do? Uh, I was in a, an agency where I had to do all graphic design of everything, and it was all very much uh, photography related, and uh, like film was always with. Uh, the best possible director and stuff. And once in a while, there was a, uh, a project that didn't have the budget to like hire a, a big shot photographer. And uh, then they came to me and they said, well, you draw, right? Or you make things move, right? Can you do something within budget? And, and it's those projects that uh, when they came back to me and said, well, oh, you did something nice. And then that was like once or twice a year that that happened. And I found the focus to be off because those were the two projects that made me happy on that year. And those were the two that sort of rewarded me. And so I figured out that I should focus on, on those, like on the stuff I, I I, I love doing more. So I started just doing the drawing, the illustrating and the animating. And I've been doing that for like 15 years now. And always projects that I can pull off by myself. Like that's my main, uh, my main decision maker in like the pro projects I take on the stuff that I don't need like a big production uh, setup or structure. What are some of the benefits and drawbacks of doing everything yourself? The benefits are that you get to decide everything. Like there's no need for me to uh, 
make sure that I show something like in a, in, in a, in a production setting, you need to take into consideration how people look at what you show them. Like you show them something, you know it's not finished, but can you bring across that the thing that isn't finished is not what they should be looking at? Like, and me, me with myself, I don't have that problem. So I just work and I know that certain things need work and, and, and I, I tend to work with people that trust me in that regard. So they give me projects, they seldom give me like scripts, full scripts. They just say, well, we need to, like I work for a, a rock festival here in Belgium and they just come to me and they say, well, we want to show people that we're focusing on, on being a sustainable uh, rock festival. Can you do something for that? And I say, okay, yeah, uh, give me the focus point, points. They give me the focus points and I make a story and they trust me with that because they know that they can like them that sort of problem with me and I come back with some sort of solution and it's, uh, I find it very re rewarding to get that sort of trust from my clients. Hey, Mark. Yes. Space Pirate J9 is asking, were all of the textures for your characters made in Toon Boom or other software? No, uh, a lot of the uh, textures are brought in from uh, Painter, mainly. That's my go to uh, bitmap stuff. But there is like in the, like on the squirrel, for instance, there, uh, all the textures there, and like the, the stuff I showed earlier with the hand overlapping that needed some sort of a, a contrast uh, shadow line. So if I see stuff like that, then I work with the bitmap tools and the grain brushes in uh, Toon Boom to uh, bring in those little uh, extra details that I need uh, going through the process. So uh, we noticed in the, the, that often your work tends to include flat, flat colors, uh, screen tones, and very distinctive angular lines. What are some of the influences behind your style? Uh, as I said earlier, like the big graphic designers of the of the sixties, like Sol Bazan and Milton Glaser, uh, the the Bond title sequences have always been a huge influence on me, uh, and I think it's 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 telling that it's that kind of uh, those kind of people that do like illustration and design and animation as one big, uh, it's one whole thing. Like it's a thing as a whole. It's like the, the posters, uh, the Hitchcock posters and uh, uh, the title sequences, they're the same thing, except the one is moving. And so that sort of stuff is, is very influential to me. And then the, the kind of continuity between the the one uh, still piece and then the uh, the animation. Yeah, continuity is 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 uh, it's a good word to use for it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you have advice for artists outside of animation who want to dip their toes into digitally animating their work? Yes. Uh, give yourself the freedom to buy uh, something like Harmony, to uh, allow yourself to, to grow into it and allow yourself some time to learn it and, and make, make personal projects and uh, try to uh, put the bar with each project that you do a bit higher. That's the way I did it. <laughs> like I bluffed my, I, I, I'm a self-taught uh, animator. I never had a, a formal training in animation. 
but I always bluffed myself into projects. Like people were would ask, well, we want uh, a little character to tell this or that. Can you do that? And I said, yeah, sure. And I always found ways to uh, make sure people wouldn't see that I couldn't do it. And so I learned it from masking that everything I couldn't do, basically, but did. Yeah, uh, we have another question from the chat. Uh, Labello is asking, in which software did you learn animation first, and what was your path to using Harmony? I learned, uh, I used like Flash for a very short while. Uh, I didn't like it. Uh, and then I came across, uh, we were talking about, was it Digital Pro? I think it was called Digital Pro. It, before it was called Animate. So that, I was, uh, I think, on board very early on in the Toon Boom uh, history. And then uh, I started buying... Uh, my first, uh, what will later become Harmony then. And uh, to me, it felt like a bit like, like Homecoming because it's, uh, it had that sort of traditional uh, way of working and it had the sort of uh, digital way of working in a very, uh, very fluent hybrid sort of way. And that was something like I did to some uh, character animation in, in, in After Effects before that. Uh, but it was so cumbersome, like having a simple hand going from in front of a character to uh, behind the character. Uh, the only way to do that really like in, a, in an easy way was to, to make the whole scene like 3D, but then you had the camera deformation stuff and, and the rendering took like 100 times longer. And all that sort of stuff is, is absent from, from the workflow in Harmony. So I learned it from learning, uh, learning and using Harmony, basically. Um, what was your experience like working with the 3D tools in Harmony? Well, I like uh, bringing in like real 3D assets. I don't do that. Uh, I'm like talking about more like a multiplane camera where you have uh, elements on different uh, areas of a stage that you can zoom in and out of. That I do all the time. Like, can I, can I open up one more project maybe? Yeah, let's do it. So I have this illustration and can you see it? Yeah, yeah, we can see it. So just tearing the illustration apart, putting it in multiplane, it gives me a whole bunch of opportunities to, to work with it. So this is just, this is no animation whatsoever. This is just a camera moving in multiplane. And it's, I find, I find this fascinating to work with. It's, uh, It's it's lagging a bit. Uh, like if you if you watch this in like it's just a very simple multiplane thing. But it, oh, I love that. So uh, uh, you, you were mentioning earlier that um, while the perspective may not be technically correct, it looks really good. That's the main thing. I, like, I think working with uh, in a real two D environment and selling some three D movement is something that takes like uh, a bit of uh, magic tricks. I think, like having people look at the one hand while the other hand is uh, doing the the dirty stuff of the trick. It's, it's the same in, in, in the multi-layer uh, animation, I think. 
So you just make sure that uh, it looks right, but uh, backstage, like you're scaling stuff and 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 tweaking stuff, and you're doing all sorts of stuff that wouldn't be physically correct, but it's, you don't care because it's the end result that's the only thing that matters. But I like to like play with that sort of uh, uh, yeah. M- Let's call it magic. Come on. All right. Uh, so we are almost out of time. Uh, Mark, where can our viewers go on the web to see more of your work? So I have my website that shows up uh, my portfolio. That's handmademonsters.com. So all in one word, plural.com. And then I have my Instagram which is, I think, handmade monster with an underscore in, in between there. And on my Instagram, I show like recent work and I my personal projects, like the two color character stuff. And, uh, and then I have my Twitter, which is just handmade monster, one word, where uh, I tend to be more uh, opinionated is that word? <laughs> so for for what that's worth, but yeah. Uh, if you are watching the stream, just uh, after the stream ends, immediately go to uh, Mark's uh, Instagram page. His uh, two colored characters are fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for joining us in the stream, and uh, for our audience, uh, be sure to tune in next week at four p.m for another live interview, this time with uh, Gonzalo at Hookup Animation in Buenos Aires uh, for his scene in the Harmony 20 demo pack. If you want to try your hand at animation, you can find a free 21-day trial for Harmony at toonboom.com, and we'll see you next week.